All right. Now let's, um, as we've had this diversion into into software and Python and Java and statistics, let's go back and remind ourselves of the uh, physics scenarios and revisit the data analysis. So let's actually do this data information knowledge wisdom pipeline. As we just discussed in the previous lesson, each event is a vector of sensor measurements, such as the signals of the charged particle in an, in an ionized chamber, or the energy deposed when a photon bangs into a bunch of lead or something. Those are called calorimeters. Or the light in a Cherenkov counter, which measures the um, type of the particle, because the uh, light produced when you go through a, a circle Cherenkov counter depends on the mass of the particle for a given momentum. And so it's a signature, as you know the momentum from how much the particle bends in the magnetic field. Uh, Cherenkov counters tell you the mass, which allows you to label these things as ions or kaons or what have you. Um, and then because another type of particle is actually weakly interacting particles and leptons and things like that, which are signif signified by the fact that they do not interact. And um, so that they just actually pass through chunks of matter. And of course, neutrinos are also in that category. All right, so that's raw data. It's just flying at you from the uh, apparatus, that giant thing. Now we have data which you clean up by calibrating the information, you get the best possible measured data, and you still have effectively a vector of measurements. Now we want information, which is to convert those original measurements into a specification, not in terms of signals in Cherenkov counters or calorimeters, but in terms of a bunch of baryons, mesons, and leptons, and photons. And that uh, takes the, the say, what happens when the particles go through the chambers and Ionize and you detect the ionization. You convert that into a direction and a measure and a bend, which the bend then gets converted into a momentum. So you actually then end up with a list of particles. So this is still a random variable because it, it, it is no longer uh, ionized chamber measurements. It's actually number of pions and properties of pions, etc. And so that's your um, information. Then your knowledge is gotten by just compiling all sorts of information by taking all these events and putting, uh, looking at calculating things for each event and forming histograms. That's knowledge. Then you see bumps in the histogram and you will get uh, wisdom. Um, which we didn't put on the slide for some reason. Maybe, uh, Maybe we thought it was too much to, enough to get to knowledge. But wisdom is the actual final result of all of that. And the wisdom is the field agreeing the Higgs boson existed, which comes from a complicated set of, you take lots of different knowledges, the different histograms, put them all together, show they're consistent, and can be interpreted as a Higgs boson. So here's a little more detail on the raw data from the ATLAS experiment. Remember, ATLAS and CMS were two major experiments. So we get 25 megabytes of data per, per um, event. Most of that data is zero, so it reduces to 1.6 megabytes with, uh, with uh, compression. And you have um, <coughs> about a petabyte of raw data produced every second. Well, that's a little too much. Um, but remember, actually, these protons, you know, we have one proton here, another proton here, they're just passing by each other, and um, 40 million of them every second, and some of them collide. So, and in fact, too many, a lot of them collide, and you actually have to take all these collisions and extract what you want, which is those collisions which might have been, might be interesting. It's not so difficult to decide what's interesting, because most particles, when two protons collide, most things just shoot off in the direction of the protons. Only when you produce a heavy particle like a Higgs, it will actually uh, tend to send out information so-called transverse to the protons in a totally different direction. And you use that as one of the triggers of something being important. And um, 
So we have these different triggers. Some of them are done on the hardware, the actual raw hardware of the, of the apparatus instrument uh, triggers. And the second is you just take this raw data and run it through a giant cluster um, to um, select uh, events of interest. So Avenger, after all of this, around every second we have a few hundred events. And that's hundreds of megabytes of disk space per second. And that's petabytes per year. So that's the raw data. And again, we have the information and the knowledge, which you sort of discussed. The information is this, um, this is, remember the raw data effectively comes from um, CERN. <coughs> In the previous slide, I pointed out the raw data gets converted to data through calibration. Those calibrations are done by people who deeply understand the experiment and the instrument. I, I know an instrument is huge, people seem to think you should keep everything about the experiments. That's not realistic. Only the original experimentalist can possibly understand that apparatus. And so you're going to clean everything up and record for later posterity the cleaned up version of this analysis. Because nobody can remember why the particular uh, instru instrument um, behaved in the way it did on a particular day, depending on the way the beams are tuned and all sorts of complicated things. And, and so it is unrealistic to expect you go back to the raw data. Except uh, time after time. So when I did an experiment, we once messed it up and had to go back to the raw data after six months. That was a catastrophe. It made everybody really unhappy. We just messed up a calibration. Normally, you try not to mess up a calibration and convert that raw data into data. Calibration, of course, needs actually looking at the lots of events to try to make certain everything is consistent and that they're not things normalized wrong and things like that. Um, as we, the offline uh, event construction, which is actually done around the world on this large hadron collider grid, uh, whatever it is, a third of a million cores, and that is using so-called grid computing. Grid computing, this is probably the greatest success of grid computing, the discovery of the Higgs boson. And it, um, it's, grids are very suitable for this because you actually want to get the data around the world because we have these. Uh, what was it, 183 organizations in one of those experiments. And so we want to involve all those um, organizations and their compute power and their understanding. So the event reconstruction is actually done in a distributed fashion, harnessing this uh, infrastructure and knowledge and intellectual um, vigor. So, then we get this knowledge where people actually write, uh, there's a famous program called a root, which uh, we use, which uh, reads in the data. We calculate a whole bunch of information, uh, new um, potential Higgs particles or whatever you happen to be looking at. That's done by physicists who have deep understanding of what a Higgs might look like. And that then gives you uh, histograms which are presented in papers and draw positive or negative conclusions about various uh, effects. So that's what we are. That's the fun. That's specialized a little for the Atlas experiment. We're basically the same for all those experiments. <laughs>